you are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 403. Sometimes people don't want to hear the truth because they don't want their illusions destroyed. Nietzsche. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films, from predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them. The odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's filmbizbook.com. Before we get started, guys, I set up a special link to help people affected by the coronavirus, and you can donate to Feed America. There is a lot of people in need out there, and Feed America is a great organization, and they're helping millions of people on a daily basis, and they also need your help. If you want to donate, even Five bucks, ten bucks, it goes a long way. Head over to indiefilmhustle.com forward slash help. Now, guys, today we have a success story. It's a story of TVOD actually working with Amazon and cracking the code of Amazon and making money with an independent film. The filmmaker's name is Ismael Gomez, and his film is called Death of a Fool. And he was able to use $9,000 of Facebook ads to generate $72,000 in sales through TVOD on Amazon. And in our conversation, I dig deep in his techniques, how he did it, what his ideas were to target his specific niche audience, and much, much more. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Ismael Gomez. I'd like to welcome you so Ismael Gomez the third. How are you doing, Ismael? Good, Alex. Thanks for having me on the show. Ah, oh, thanks for reaching out, man. I appreciate it. Anytime there's a filmmaker who wants to talk about distribution and the truth behind self-distribution, numbers, raw data, and all the other little warts and all, good and bad, uh, I'd like to talk to them. Because uh, it's rare. Like you said in your email, it's a rare thing. You, yeah. There is not a lot of transparency out there. So uh, before we get into that, um, how Mm -hmm. did you get into the film business? Uh, Well, you know, (laughs) I was um, so I was born in Cuba in Havana and um, I grew up Cubano. I I couldn't help it, man. I have to hit Cubano. It just comes out. And, you know, (laughs) (laughs) so I was born, you know, I was born in Havana and I grew up watching, you know, Disney Pixar movies. And um, actually, the first time I went to a theater was to see The Lion King, and uh, I was obsessed with it. Like, when I came out of the theater, I was telling my mom and my dad, like, this is what I want to make. And it started as a cartoon, you know, like animated films. And and then my dad, because he was very well-connected in the artistic world, he would get me into the film festivals in Havana. And I saw Apocalypse Now when I was, like, nine. So you can imagine <laughs> being nine years old and watching Watch Apocalypse, now. Apocalypse Now. <laughs> so, you know, I got really obsessed with that. And um, and I had the opportunity when I came to the United States. So I came to live, uh, immigrated to the United States with my mom. My dad was already here. And I came on a plane in 2009. And um, I went. <laughs> you have to, you have to sit. For everybody listening, uh, us Cubans, we, we're, we're known for being good swimmers. Um, so came on a plane. My, my parents came on planes as well. 
Yeah. So I came here and um, I always had the passion in Cuba, but I, you know, I finished high school in Cuba. So when I got here, I went straight after one year that I got all my papers and everything. Um, I went to the New York Film Academy and I started studying film and it, it was a great experience because they're very hands on, you know. So I really I've never shot. I mean, I've made home videos, but I was there shooting with actual film, like 16 millimeters and 35 millimeters. Mm -hmm. And it was a pretty cool experience. It was an amazing experience. And after that, I I moved back to Florida. I got my bachelor's in film because my whole family was here already. And uh, so after I graduated, I went back to New York and I started working as an editor. Uh, so I realized uh, while I was in film school, I realized all right, I don't think people hire directors. <laughs> not, off, not off the bat, sir, no. <laughs> not, not very often. So you, uh, directors end up always working on their stuff. So I have to develop a second skill, you know, and I also realized for me in the editing is where really the magic happened. Like I would be able to save because my shootings were always super cha uh, chaotic and when I got to the editing, I kind of like make things work a little bit. So I realized like this is where the magic happens. So I got to learn this skill. So I got very, you know, um, well versed in Final Cut 7, rest in peace. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love and, that rest in peace. <laughs> and uh, and then, you know, and then Premiere when it came out and Avid and then Final Cut 10. And so I started editing and I started editing my friends, short films, my own stuff. And then. I got my first feature film and then I got my second one and I ended up editing like, I don't know, like nine feature films already, independent feature films. And yeah, so and then after that, I um, I moved back, you know, my girlfriend was here, my family was here, I was up there by myself dealing with the winter, you know. My Caribbean yeah. flesh is not used yeah, to that. I was, the Cubans, the Cubans don't, they don't like the, they don't like so, the winter so much. I couldn't deal with the cold. <laughs> so I came back here and uh, I had this movie, Death of a Fool, and I had the vision of my company, Rabbit Hole Pictures. And um, at that time, Moonlight came out. And I was like, I saw what Barry Jenkins did in Miami, and it was very inspiring. And I was like, you know, I can, I can do this. I can be, let's say, a big fish in a small pound, right? I can start here, try to make uh, fantasy films, which... I don't see actually when I was doing a lot of research when I made Death of a Fool and thinking about other fantasy films shot in Miami and I couldn't like find anything. So I, I got very inspired and I was like, you know what, I'm going to open the company here. I'm going to start making films here. And uh, yeah, that's kind of like how it happened. It's so, fu it's so funny because you, you, you've walked a very similar path that I have because I did the exact same thing. I was like, I'm going to be a director. But I see that no one's hiring me right now um, because I am 20 whatever young and I started getting into post. And that's exactly and it's and I discovered the exact same thing. Rest in peace, Final Cut 7. Uh, but also <laughs> just it, everything happens there. And that's a th sometimes I think a lot of filmmakers don't do that. They don't understand that you need to have a skill that pays you. Mm -hmm. while you're chasing the dream, while you're building those tools in your toolbox. That's so extremely For sure. But you jumped on your first feature much faster. It took me 20 years to jump on my first feature. So you, you've jumped a much, much quicker. So tell I me about the, a lot of begging. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. I can imagine. So, <laughs> so tell me. Yeah. So tell me. De what, tell me about your film Death of a Fool. OK, so Death of a Fool uh, was actually based on a semester film that I did at NIFA, the, the film academy. And mm -hmm. um, so I have been writing it for two years. And I was already in Miami and I started submitting it to uh, uh, screenplay competitions. And then I ended up being uh, uh, semifinalists in like three of them and then quarterfinals in two of them. And then uh, Blue Cat, it's a screenplay competition in L.A. Um, we ended up winning it in 2008, uh, 2018. Uh, uh, Joe, my, uh, the co-writer and I, so we both won. The competition and they give you ten thousand dollars is is the cash prize. So that was kind of like the beginning of the funding process of the film. So after we won Blue Cat, uh, 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 um, we ended up like talking to a, some investors that I have worked with in the past for other projects or other businesses that I that I was running. 
And um, yeah, it just took a lot of convincing and um, and really, and then also I got very prepared in terms of, you know, not counting on Sundance and or you know the 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 lottery uh, the lottery ticket and really trying to think how would I be able to recoup this money, you know. So we were able to bring uh, a few investors on board. Then I did, I would say like. 30% of the financing myself. And yeah, we got everything together. We, what, was, and what was the budget? It ended up being uh, like $103,000. So 100, 100,000, okay. okay. which was really challenging. Cause let me tell you the stuff that we pulled with a hundred thousand dollars. Cause it's, yeah, it's a fantasy it's, film. And you know, you got like, you have a magic fruit and you have like, like magical places and you have, it's like flashbacks to like the seventies. So it's a lot of crazy stuff, and um, yeah, but you know, I had an amazing team. That's what I can say. The the cinematographer, the producer, everyone was just so awesome, and 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 that's the also the cool thing about shooting in Miami that not a lot of films are being shot here. So everyone was really excited about that. You know, people were willing to just work and uh, give you good rates and all that to to make the film happen. Yeah, that's exactly what happened with me when I made my first film there. I was so excited just to be like, oh, someone's shooting. Let's <laughs> let's let's yeah. do this. You know, it's not bad boys, but we'll do it. Let's go. Yeah. Um, which is really cool. Now, you uh, when you made the fi- you finished the film, mm-hmm. uh, now I'm assuming you went down the the festival circuit and the distribution path. So tell me about what you felt did you do the festival circuit at all or what did you feel? <clears throat> well, I um uh, sorry. I sent the film to Sundance. Of course, because we all have to donate money to Robert Redford's retirement. You know, <laughs> so I was like, uh, you know, let me send it here. Um, actually, the cinematographer, uh, Layla Kilborn, she was uh, she had been to Sundance like seven times. She even won with documentaries. So, you know, I sent the film to Sundance, and um, I did. Uh, I think Sundance was the film festival because I had just finished it, and I didn't want to send like work in progress to mm-hmm. film festivals, you know? Right. So I sent it to Sundance and then, you know, got the rejection letter. And around the time, so I had a really tough call. This is the, where we get into distribution. Cause then 2020 had just started, you know, and I had to wait probably till the summer when the film festivals were gonna open again. Um, right. Uh, you know, like the the fantasy film festivals, also like uh, Fantasia, like that, and- yeah, Fantasia, Fantastic Fest. You know, all those. So I was like, should I wait until the summer, like waste six eight months and wait yeah. for this film festival, or should I just launch, do do a theatrical uh, premiere here in the Coral Gables, the art cinema, uh, and, and launch the film. Uh, and on Amazon or should I just wait for the film festival? So I really hate being passive, (laughs) you know, and putting like hoping that someone else, you know, allows. And by the way, I didn't, I didn't even, you know, I I heard about the coronavirus in China and all this. This was uh, like in January of February. And, um, and also I had an eye opening experience because I ended up going to Sundance uh, with the co-founder of Robert Hope Pictures, one of my best friends, Larry, uh, I told them, you know, we should go to Sundance, even though we didn't get in. I feel that we hear so much about Sundance, and I've never been to Sundance, so we should go check it out, you know? And for me, when I went there, and the eye-opening experience that I had is that even people that I saw got into Sundance were struggling to get a distribution deal. Oh, Absolutely. <laughs> And I saw I saw everyone hustling and I'm like, OK, they made it here and they're still hustling and trying to get a distribution deal and thinking they might get like ripped off. So this is not even a guarantee, you know, so I think I might be better off just distributing the film myself, learning this process, uh, try to do my best and really be self-reliant, you know. So, so yeah, so I, uh, I made the call and I told, you know, I spoke to my, uh, to the producer of the film and I told her, like, I think this is the way to go. And we had the screening here at Coral Gables. We, it was completely sold out. And then two weeks later, 
because uh, you know it was still hot. And, you know, I, I I released the film on on Amazon Video. Yeah. Now, did you, you did you get some uh, deals? Uh, did you get some deals offered to you? Yes, yes. So I spoke to a few. Uh, first of all, I I saw all the episodes um, on Indie Film Hustle about distribution. You know, and I I wrote like I actually have a notepad and I wrote every time that I had an insight or something that I didn't know about, I would write it down and then revisit. You know, you were you were prepared. You were <laughs> locked. You were locked and loaded when these guys came to you. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'm so yeah so they came. You know, they came trying to bite. Um, a few of them, I, I think, a few of them had good intentions. I would sure. say, but still, I was like, even so though the they deals, had, so, what were the kind of deals you were getting? You don't so, have to say the names. Just kind of deals. Yeah. That you so were off. Uh, with sales agents, you know, I um, a few of them wanting to uh, wanted to charge me, which I thought. I don't know if you really think the film has potential and you can make some money. Why would you want to charge me, you know, up front? I, I, but I guess, you know, they need to keep their business going and all that. But that for me was, uh, you know, a red flag. I didn't want to, even though if it had good intentions, I didn't want to give into that because it was money that I would use, you know, that I could use in Facebook ads or things like that, you know? Mm-hmm. And with distributors, they, a lot of them didn't reply. And the ones that did, they had like 15 year, you know, um, 15 year uh, terms contract. Yeah. yeah. And I was 15 years. Like <laughs> you're going to own my movie for 15 years. That's a long time with no money up front. I'm assuming with no, no minimal guarantee. No money. And it was there any, is it, was there any marketing capital or oh, no of capital? course it was like $50,000 like 50, every year. It was every, like year. <laughs> every year. Yeah. And I was like, all right, you're going to spend $50,000 on my film every year, I every guess. Every year they had that sons of. Yeah. And then, and then you could, you could, you know, you could, uh, I was like, is this negotiable? And then they would said yes. And then, okay. And then they would negotiate and bring it out to 10 years and, you know, $20,000 in, in but the is market. It, but, isn't that, but isn't that interesting that they, and I've said this a bunch of times, that they throw out the worst deal. Yeah. To see if you bite, and if you bite, oh good, I'm going to screw you now. Yeah. Um, exactly. And then if you yeah. want to negotiate, I'm just going to screw you a bit less. I'm yeah. still screwing you. At the end of the day, you're getting screwed. Yeah, it's kind of like they want to they want to stab you, right? And they first put like a shotgun, and you're like, oh, a shotgun, that's really bad. And then they show you the knife, and it's like, oh, okay, I guess the knife is not I that guess, bad. So how, <laughs> would you rather get your head blown off or just a little a little stab in the back? It's just a little. So, yeah. So and yeah. So so then so okay. So none of these obviously none of these deals. After listening to everything I've said, you just said no. 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 If you wouldn't have listened to all these podcasts, you uh, might have pro- been probably yeah probably. Yeah, that's probably. Just, that's that's why I want that information to get out to as many yeah. people as humanly possible, man. They have to. It's, I mean, and it's they're amazing. persuasive. They oh, are persuasive. sure. What did they promise you? They promised you to get you on all the platforms, right? Yeah, oh, like, I'll get you on all the platforms. Everywhere. I know somebody over at Netflix, so we'll pitch Netflix. Uh, I know somebody over at HBO. Maybe I could get you an HBO deal. I got someone on Showtime. Maybe we could do a pay cable deal. And uh, what, what's what's the special placement? We're gonna get you oh, special placement. the special you know, placement. Probably yeah. iTunes, Shark, and all those. Because things. Because if you go with us, like if you go through an aggregator, you're just gonna be thrown in. But if you go with, you get special placement on iTunes. Uh, and that whole scenario, it's it's so and it's getting worse. <clears throat> the predatory aspect of distribution is getting worse and worse as everything starts to tighten and tighten around. Mm-hmm. So that's why I wanted to bring you on because you're pretty fresh. You're like this is happening within the last three or four months. Yeah, uh, yeah. you were getting these offers. And all right, so I sorry, and, and even the ones that have good intentions, let's say. They're still a business, you know, and they still it's need a, to survive. It's the old business model. Yeah, it's the and if they business. have 10 films and nine of them are performing better than mine, you know, they're going to they're going to sell those they're going to pay more attention to those nine. And it's not only that, it's also like I always put this analogy that it's a business, right? And if my film is a tangerine, let's say, and People here buy watermelons. They will market my film as a watermelon to people who like watermelons because they have to sell. And I don't want my pe- like I want people who like tangerines to see my film. I don't care about people who like watermelons because then that's where the bad reviews come and people. It, I feel that I'm actually you know cheating, right? And I'm lying to people because I made you think that this was a watermelon and you came saw my film, paid for it, and now you're feeling happy. 
you know, and I understand that. So I, I that's that was also for me like I wanted to have full control, you know. I'm I'm a little yeah. bit OCD, so. Yeah, no, and 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 obviously, so so you're telling me that distributors might lie in trailers to get to buy the movie. I can't believe that. That seems so unlike yeah. Hollywood. Uh, <laughs> um, and that's the other thing that people that that filmmakers don't understand is when they do sign a deal with the distributor, unless it's in the contract, they have no control of how that movie is presented. Poster design, trailer design. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's. I mean, I remember when I had my, I had a short compilation, and a distributor picked it up. I was able to get it back from him, but he put on the cover some woman with a gun who had nothing. She wasn't even in the movie. It was. It wasn't even the movie. I was like, what? What is it? What is this? And it's. It's. It is the nature of what they're trying to do. It's the old model of doing things. So it, it's going to be interesting to see how this is all going to keep going. <laughs> so obviously, you decided that stuff that the the traditional distribution was not going to be your path and your budget range makes it a good viable option for for self-distribution so tell me your journeys through <laughs> self-distribution and what and what's going how, what happened so um you know i started looking into um how would i self-distribute like where you know what platform i would use so you know there was vimeo which obviously has an main uh, like an amazing potential cuz i think you keep like 90% of the revenues mm-hmm. and then there was amazon and then there was other things like selling from your website like uh, gumroad i think it's called mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know a bunch of those but for me just thinking as an audience like it's better like people trust is a big thing right so mm-hmm. People trust Amazon. People don't trust Vimeo or Gumroad. Not a lot of people, like 1% of the people. So Not, mo- not movie-going people. Like people buying yeah. online products or courses or things like that, they might want to do Gumroad. And Vimeo, the <clears throat> filmmaker will understand who they are, but general public won't. Yeah, so I was like, you know, Amazon is the best deal. And also, you know, even though I could have gone through an aggregator, Right. Um, I think I looked into uh, Film Hub and Bitmax, you know, mm-hmm. I felt like I don't want to sparse like the attention. Like I want to just have one place where I can send everyone. And here's the film. Watch it, which I also think if all the sales go there is going to help with the algorithm and more people, they will promote Mark. the film to other people, right? Mark. So, Mark. so I was like, you know, and I actually, I did, I did a few polls on on Facebook groups and stuff like that. Where do you watch your movies? And I would see Amazon was always the top one. So I was like, okay, Amazon has to be. And I thought of myself. I mean, I rent movies on Amazon, and um, so, so yeah, so I chose Amazon, which. You know, Amazon is amazing. It's great that they give the opportunities to filmmakers, you know, and I have spoken to them before. It it kind of it's kind of, you know, it kind of sucks that they take 50 percent. You know, I think I wish they would take less like like Vimeo. But, you know, it is what it is. You got to deal with. So for so for people to understand. So you, they take 50 percent of your transactional. Yeah. Like so transactional video uh, TVOD, you know, if you if you sell if someone buys your movie for ten dollars. Five goes to Amazon and five goes to you, so they take fifty percent of them. Yeah, and and you know what, I, I I have the same. I mean, I self-published my books through Amazon, and they're actually worse, um, worse than fifty percent sometimes. But the different the problem the exposure, the, the yeah. Book, you are the largest marketplace where everybody has their credit card and everyone trusts everything. So, a fifty-fifty split might sound bad, but the amount of a, the amount of access you're getting for that 50% is the only thing that makes sense for that scenario. Yeah. But now if you would have signed a deal with a distributor, then yeah. they would have taken a percentage off the so at the end of the day you oh, might the 50%, even 50%. Yeah. Now you might even get really 10%. If you what, what I'm really curious about is like how much like how much Amazon I wonder if Amazon offers that same type of deal to big companies like Disney and and no. Warner Brothers if if they give them 50 50 or if they offer because i feel like you know as a small business as an entrepreneur the starting they should offer better deals for us than disney but you know but it, that's, not the the way way. The world, that's not the <laughs> that's way the, the world, game so 
that's not the way the world works. But and we could have a whole episode <laughs> just talking about Amazon and how they treat filmmakers. But at the end of the day, they have opened up a marketplace that filmmakers. Yep. So if you like, let's take let's take Amazon off the table that they shut down and like no more filmmakers. Yeah, that that really that really hurts a yeah, lot of really a, a lot of businesses. So it's so, amazing. No, I'm really grateful. It's, it's, I think it's amazing. I think it's amazing yeah. what they're doing. But I agree with you. It should be like but, a 70, 70, 30 is fair. 70, yeah, 30. 70, 30. I mean, I think it's amazing. I'm really grateful that I can do this stuff, you know, but if I have Jeff Bezos in front of me, it would be something that I will <laughs> bring up. Also, also a Cuban brother. Yeah. um so yeah so i decided amazon and then um and tvod mostly right it's all tvod yeah i i personally you know i've i have seen a bunch of my friends gone through distribution and gone through amazon too and for me something that i learned is to not undervalue your art and this is something that i learned actually in the theatrical screening so when i had the premiere um at Cora Gables we sold out the whole screening and I actually brought some merchandise and I remember you know it was like this my cousin who's an artist made like this she printed a poster on like this wooden um kind of like frame and it was really beautiful um and we only made like 20 and I was thinking you know I'm not gonna make it too many I'm gonna sell them for 20 bucks or whatever because you know not a lot of people are gonna buy it and stuff and like we got there we screened the movie and right when people came out, it got sold out in like literally in, in one minute. And people wanted like, we want more, we want more. And I was like, oh my God, I should have brought this more. Like uh, I should have made more, you know, and the, the screening was sold out. Like there were like- So let's talk, let's talk numbers. Take- so let's talk numbers on that screening. So you rented out the theater or was yeah. it a split? I, I four walled the screening. So I ended oh, up- you four walled. So what yeah. did it cost? It was like- uh, so they do by the hour, so it was like two fifty an hour, and I ended up doing three hours, so it was like seven fifty. And not bad. Um, yeah, I did. I did like a Q and A afterwards with the uh, the cast. Um, and how much? And how much did you? And the tickets. The, just all the I, ticket sales. Yeah, so I ended up using event rights uh, again, full control. You know, I put the price of the tickets, everything, and. Between the tickets and the merchandise, I ended up making like uh, 13, 1400 bucks. Okay. So you know, okay. it was a good day. You're in profit. <laughs> you're, you're in profit. You're in profit. And yeah. then how about the merch? How much did the merch take you over the top? Well, that's well. The merch was like uh, the tickets were like eleven hundred, and the merch was like three hundred. So combined, okay. they were like fourteen hundred. You so know, it's a good day. Yeah, and I thought about. I mean, I thought like you know, I can keep doing theatrical in Florida, South Florida, and maybe you know do like five or ten more of these, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but then um, I ended up like two weeks after, on February 20th, I launched the film on, on Amazon. So the first thing that I did was, oh, oh, so talking about Amazon, for me, learning from that experience, I was like, you know, I'm going to put my film for sale first so you can only buy it for like only purchase option. And no, I'm not, no rental, no rental, no rental. Just purchase, just oh, straight purchase. Because I knew the people that had just seen the movie were going straight to get on T bot. They were going to rent it. You know, there was a lot of people. I got all their emails that were waiting. So I went straight to T bot. I think I put like fourteen ninety nine uh, was the first price that I did, and um, I put no rentals like the first week like the first 10 days, because I knew it was going to be hot. You know, all those people were going to come and buy the movie. So I did that. I put it for purchase option only. Um, I didn't do any. Oh, I, so I got a lot of, uh, you know, uh, newspapers, radio everywhere, you know, talking about the premiere, Corey Gables, like local news. And and then um, a lot of social media on all over Facebook and Instagram. And then I ended up... Um, just put in the purchase option for the, those 10 first days. So and then only the, the let's say, the warm audience, the loyal audience, right, the true fans came those those first uh, 10 days and they purchased the movie. Um, I can't remember the exact number of how many people, you know, but I was, while that was happening, I started learning Facebook ads. I already had, like, ran Facebook ads in the past and Instagram, with uh, some other businesses that I that I had in the past, and also with the with Rabbit Hole on Instagram, 
but I hire someone to pretty much kind of teach me like all the ins and outs, you know, all the tricks and little things. And even though you, I thought that I knew a lot, like this person really taught me a bunch of stuff that I was like, oh, wow, that's how it works. Okay. So, so that gave me a lot of insights and, um, I slowly started using Facebook ads and Instagram ads. And for me, what I think, uh, has worked so far, which I told you in the email, like, I feel that a lot of people always want to, like, I want my film to be seen as many, you know, that many people as possible see my film. Right. And I feel that's a big mistake. I mean, if they could see it for free, of course, try as many people as you can. But when you have to pay for the Facebook ads, you have to make sure that the person that watches the film, right, the, the trailer, the teaser, they're really, uh, you know, they trust the brand. And if they don't know the brand, you know, why would they click to watch the movie? So for me, the name Miami, right, was the that trust. So, for example, when I was running ads, I realized the copy that would get the most, uh, let's say, engagement was when I would put like, uh, you know, Miami releases a new mystical adventure, a new fantasy film, because I I thought if I put like Rabbit Hole Pictures releases a new, you know, yeah. mystical, they're like, who's Rabbit Hole Pictures? But when you put Miami, people. Th- somehow in their heads that's what i'm you know, guessing they're they're guessing like oh so miami it's kind of like made this film like the city itself you know it's it's made in miami so then i only targeted uh like 25 mile radios uh nice. races in, in 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 miami and and that started getting you know a lot of uh attraction and then you know a lot of experimenting i think you have to do a lot of testing like a lot, like, you know, I had a teaser under one minute. I had a trailer, which was a minute and 40. I had pictures, you know, I have different copywriting. And also you have to get, this is a trick that I learned also that you have to have social proof before you sent out. So when I would first create the ad, I'd have like my small group of, you know, friends and family that I would send it to them and be like, okay, like this comment that you saw that you loved it or whatever. So when the advertisement will go out, right, you have social proof, someone sees it and they're like, oh, there's people commenting, there's people liking it, let me check it out, right? And so what I started doing also, the strategy was, I would do video views. So it's one of the options when you run Facebook ads. At first I started doing traffic, which was kind of like a mistake, that you, the traffic um, strategies pretty much, uh, Facebook finds people that would click on the ad and would go to the website where you send them. Mm-hmm. But by doing video views, Facebook pretty much finds people that usually watch videos. Like they right. watch the most percentage, let's say, of videos. So I started using the video ads and that started getting better results. And people will still click on it and go to the website, right? Mm-hmm. And then I would do video views Monday through Friday. And then right. Saturday and Sunday, I would do a reach strategy, um, Facebook ad, which I would say, okay, so from Monday through Friday, I do this video views. And then right. Saturday and Sunday, I create an audience that everyone who watched the video from Monday through Friday, 95% of like people who watched 95% of my videos, mm-hmm. right? I would make that an audience. Facebook would find all those people, create a custom audience. And then on Saturday and Sunday, I would just target those people again and uh, with a reach uh, strategy and be like, okay, now reach as many people as you can within this parameter that I just put that they're already a warm audience because they saw the teaser and find them and show them again, you know, the trailer. So that would bring that would bring really good. But you're using but you're using this based off of a 1499 price point not a no, no, no. when i started yeah when, when i started doing facebook ads i already had the rental option so okay. I, I actually brought it down to nine nine ninety nine and uh, and five ninety nine so i started seeing you know uh what most of the rentals will be on amazon and i saw a bunch of like new releases were not uh 5.99 uh for right. rental right. so i put it 5.99 and actually this was really funny because you have to you have to test 
things out. You have to just don't be afraid of like sometimes people want to be too like logical and you think of like, oh, my film is an indie film. Who would rent it? Who would pay five ninety nine? Uh, and a lot of people don't know, you know, like normal audiences. They don't know. They just see a, uh, they just see a film. If it's a cool trailer, a cool poster, maybe they don't know the actors, but the genre itself. Right. Since it's a fantasy right. kind of mystical supernatural film. The genre itself will sell the film, and if they connect with Miami, they will sell it. And actually, I did a crazy thing for for like a week. I didn't make a profit, but I broke even. But when the whole coronavirus hit, they started doing this whole theatrical um, premieres for nineteen nineteen ninety nine. So I actually for a week I removed everything and I put it for nineteen ninety nine. I was like, you know what? Maybe people will confuse me with like Disney. <laughs> <laughs> and That's like, funny. like the invisible man that was also coming out during that time. And, um, and like, I don't know, like 10 people bought it, like 10 people bought it. And, and you know, it cost me a lot on Facebook ads. So I kind of like, I ended up breaking even. So I was like, you know, I, I know that I can find more people, but it will cost me more. So let it's me risk. just, let me just bring it back to, uh, to a, a, a different price. Yeah, kind of like what I had it before, but it was, it was it was a you know an interesting experience seeing that there would actually someone be willing to pay 19.99 for the film just like they would pay for any of those big studio films you know. So Smart, let me ask you in regards to the Facebook Facebook ads and Instagram ads. A lot of times I found that filmmakers who spend a lot of money on those, the ROI doesn't make sense, the return on investment because they they're either not optimizing properly or they're their offer is just too low of price. Like you're talking about 99 cents and 199, 299, 399. You've got to get volume, you know. So if you spend five dollars to get a 199 rental, that's not business. So how did you make it work? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I kept the price of 599, you know, okay. the rental, and purchased a 999. Um, so I knew that every time there would be a sale. I would make pretty much three dollars, right? So uh, from five ninety nine, fifty percent. So I knew that okay, I have to make under uh, you know under three dollars, and so I would make sure. And this is really hard to. What happens with Amazon is really hard to track the sales that come from the Facebook ads because Amazon doesn't give you the information. Right. Amazon keeps all the data for themselves. Oh, so you have no so you can't do a Facebook pixel with it for Amazon. No, you can't because it's, it's on the Amazon page. Right. right. And they're so not gonna let you pixel that. Right. They're not going to let you pixel that. So you could, I couldn't do a pixel. So it was. But what happens is that uh, I say like people what I'm guessing, like people a lot of times they try many strategies at the same. Like what I would do is like I'm going to stick with one strategy one week. To see the results of that week, right? And then I will see, okay, so this week I spent this much and this much came in and, you know, I wasn't doing anything else. And I have counted the clicks on the Facebook ads and I saw that, you know, every 25 cents someone was clicking on the ad. Um, so I started kind of like comparing the numbers. And then after one week, I would switch to a different strategy. And that way, you know, I would kind of like know what strategy worked the most. But again, for me, it was all about that. Like you have to know your audience, you know. And for example, I also thought, um, even though the film has, uh, let's say, the film is about a grandson and a grandfather, right? They're like afterlife investigators. So there is a younger audience and there's an older audience. And for me, I focused mostly on the older audience because they have money <laughs> number one you know younger audiences i say it you know for my sister <laughs> uh, they don't like to pay for stuff they want just free content you know because i mean you know they grew up on youtube and even i sometimes like struggle like oh should i pay should i really rent this movie or should i wait until it comes out on netflix or any you know yeah. so it's that's just the subscription mode has changed, you know, people's mentality when it comes to that. Right. So I was like, I have to focus on the older audience because they're the ones that are really going to pay for this. Right. And most of the time, maybe they bring their children, you know, their grandchildren or whatever to watch the movie. 
Uh, now, the problem with you also have to think about the downsides. Like the problem with the older audience is also they don't leave a lot of reviews, right? <laughs> older people don't go on Amazon and start reviewing, you know, like, oh, I love the film or whatever. And which actually, you know, the reviews is, is such a tricky game because, you know, mostly like people who only have negative things to say are the ones that go and review. <laughs> like you watch <laughs> it, a movie it, it and the you world. loved it. It's like, this was the best movie ever. And you don't go on like INDV or Rotten Tomatoes and you don't review it. You're like, this was amazing. But then, you know, those pessimistic the negative people, the trolls, they just go there and start like, oh, this was awful, you know. But it is what it is. But then I try to like, you know, if I saw that someone watched the movie or tagged the trailer or the poster or something, I would message them like, please, if you like the movie, leave us a review on Amazon because it can help, you know. Um, so, but it was a combination, Alex, of of a lot of like work on my side. I did I did a lot of like say you know guerrilla marketing myself, with you know on Instagram. I, for example, the Cora Gables Art Cinema. I went on Instagram and I saw, you know, that they had 8,000 followers. So I would go to each one of those followers and literally message them like, hey, we're Miami Film Company. We just make this film. If you like, you know, this type of genre, go check it out. Literally every day I would message until like Instagram blocked me pretty much. And be like, you exceeded like your limit for today. So, you know, so it was it was a combination of things, you know, and like being on the Miami um, Herald on the newspaper also, you know, brought sales. Um, and then just combining all that with Facebook, Instagram, and and um, just doing a lot of work. And also, like I told you, trying a lot of different content. People sometimes you create, you create a trailer and that's it. Like they market everything with that trailer. Like, you know, I had trailer, teaser, short clips, like I had at least like, I don't know, like 30, different types of like assets let's say right you know, yeah. now use. the um the thing that's fascinating as well is that you decided to focus on your local regional market which is something that most filmmakers don't think about because they're like oh it's just the local i need to be big i need the world to see my movie i i need to be as big as tarantino and nolan i need to be that <laughs> where you focus on the regional, which is extremely powerful. That's a much warmer audience. If, you, if I can take your mm -hmm. term, it's a mm -hmm. much warmer audience. Uh, and a lot of people will just support because you're a local boy and Miami's mm -hmm. not a small town either. No, it's a, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big city. It's one it's of a, the, it's cities. one of the big in the, in the U S absolutely. So, but even with that, you were still able to generate interest and, and revenue from that. So that's, um, that's a really great way of doing it. And that's not, you know, that's also like, you know, this was like I at the same time while I was in post-production, you know, I really studied a lot of like marketing, you know, like Seth Godin. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, the Purple Cow. And uh, there's another guy called Roy Sutherland. He's from London, um, you know, and really started marketing and uh, and try to learn as much as possible. And one of the ideas is like how, you know, how ideas like spread, right? And everything starts small. Like if you think about Facebook, how did Facebook start? Facebook started in Harvard and then it started with only Ivy Leagues, right? Mm -hmm. And then once they got the Ivy Leagues, when people see something that they like, they will tell their friends and their friends will tell their friends and that's how things spread. So I was like, I'm only going to focus in Miami. And then from there on, actually later on, I started seeing there were some sales in the UK where I was doing no marketing and which was really interesting. I was like, I don't know how people in the UK are watching this, but I guess they're just like, because they see it as an American movie, they're, they're watching it. But, you know, I really focus just on local and make like, I would target Miami 25 uh, miles radius. Right. And I would say people who liked Pixar, Disney, Harry Potter, you know, films that were kind of had the same tone that my film, um, and then I would also do besides that and, uh, would narrow down, down the audience that they would also purchase on amazon.com, which is pretty much everyone, but you know, but that would really put it like, just find those people that have purchased on Amazon, which, you know, that like they have Amazon instant video, whatever. Um, and they like 
these type of films are similar. Now, what? Um, so let's get some numbers, if you don't mind. <laughs> what are the returns of all of this work, and how much revenue have you generated uh, with off of Amazon? So um, Amazon uh, has been like uh, thirty six thousand dollars, which that's insane. Which is, I mean, it, when you really think about it, it was seventy two, <laughs> you know. But they took, of, and that, so that's thirty six to you. Thirty six to me, yeah. Thirty six. So you generated seventy two thousand gross mm-hmm. off of this technique, off of what you're doing, mm-hmm. um, and you're a, and you're a hundred thousand dollar, yeah, indie with no stars attached, in a unique genre being like mm-hmm. fantasy is not, you know, it's 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 there's less wa- there's less uh, sharks or less mm-hmm. blood in that water. It's a little bit more blue oceany if you want. Yeah. The fishing's better in in your area. So it's a niche. It's a niche. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a large niche, but it's a niche. So you've been able to generate. And then how much did that cost you? Uh, and then uh, yeah, and then nine thousand dollars in marketing, around nine thousand dollars so far. So That's... the profit ends up being like uh, what twenty seven plus the oh. the what I made in the theatrical premiere. It was so like 20. I don't know about I don't know about you, but I will spend nine thousand dollars every day to get twenty seven thousand. Oh like yeah. That's, <laughs> All, all day. I'll, I'll just continue to feed that beast. So yeah. it, it's fascinating. You're one of the few heard of you're making it work. Now you have a, a very, there's a lot of unique elements, like in every project, like and you mentioned range 15 in your email, that mm-hmm. was a unique set of circumstances in a unique time period. Every movie is going to be a little bit different. Like your movie might be hitting at the right time with the right movie. That also helped, you know, you know the, I mean, the, the whole COVID. situation that everyone was stuck home, you know, stuck at home. Um, and looking for new, fresh content. And then you just happen to be, right I've got there. fresh content. I also know how to market it because I've done my homework. I've done my research. And I want you to, I want to, I want you to tell all the filmmakers out there, please, because I've been preaching this for the longest time, that filmmakers need to understand marketing. They need to educate themselves on the distribution process process mm-hmm. the self-distribution process all the non-sexy because everything you're talking about is not sexy it's not as sexy as the new alexa <laughs> with the new the cook lens yeah you know and the, the techno crane that i'm going to work on and it's not the sexy stuff um can you please tell the, the audience the value that you have found by doing that deep dive into marketing because obviously it's working yeah i mean i would tell you this this is how i think about it if you know how to market, if you know how to distribute, if you know how to sell anything, then you can make anything, right? It's not like you make something and then like, how am I going to sell this? It's like learn how to sell things. Like you, I think of like Steve Jobs, which I think is once one of the greatest marketers ever, right? How he created uh, Apple and all those things. And he would find uh how to like think about it like how people pay six times more for an iphone which is pretty much does the same as a as as an android you know an lg like it's just not as pretty it's it's just not as pretty and it's the brand because he grew the brand (laughs) and like he connected with a certain type of appeal and for me was like i thought about like you know i have because people just like to make things you know as an artist you just want to think about the creative process but then you end up being, you know, at the mercy <laughs> of like, uh, you know, distributor. And sometimes you will find a good distributor. But like, even if you have a good distributor, wouldn't you want to know how that works? And they might not even you. I mean, if you know your audience, if you know your movie, your input might be, you know, so valuable for them that might help even with the sales. So for me, it's like you have to learn, you know, again, like I would recommend Seth Godin, uh, every, a, all his YouTube videos. He also has a course that I took online. It's a, called the Semin- the Marketing Seminar. Uh, Roy Sutherland yeah. uh, from, uh, from Great Britain. You Gary know, v. Like, Gary V. Gary V. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's actually doing uh, tea with Gary V. every morning at 9 a.m. I yeah. follow him. Yeah, he's he's pretty cool. He's got a bunch of good stuff, you know, and and yeah, and uh, watch Indie Film Hustle, all the episodes about distribution, you know, try to learn as much as you can, because that's the only way that uh, you can be self-reliant and 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 not depend 
again on the lottery ticket of getting into Sundance. And and I also thought about that. I was telling Larry, uh, my friend, the, the co-founder, I, I told him like, you know, like I think of Disney, okay, they're huge, they're so successful, but I think of Disney, I think of like, you know, Warner Brothers, they don't go to no film festivals, they don't care about film festivals, <laughs> they go straight to the audience, why should we, and I love film festivals, I have nothing against them, right, but you playing by the rules, so why should we be like waiting, I was, I would keep some minutes to film festival, but we shouldn't be waiting for that to be our strategy we should be just getting straight to the audience you know mm -hmm. so so yeah so that's it's that's it's it, it's it's an inspiring story brother i really appreciate it you've been able to do the numbers that you've talked about which is like no one's getting rich you're not getting you're not, you're not rolling around in it but it's a, you're building a business you're no, starting and I pay my investors that that's the most important thing now that I, i'll be able to pay my investors you know that i can talk again for my second feature film that i want you know so it also creates that, you know, trust, which is really important. And I'm building my audience as well. People who already saw the movie and liked it and, you know, uh, uh, saw the company in Miami. So uh, just thinking, just thinking from listening to your story, I think you could definitely benefit from reading uh, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur. I think your head's going to explode. <laughs> I'm getting it. I'm getting it for sure. If if I may do a self plug. Uh, no, I think there's a lot of I think you're leaving a lot of money on the table honestly, uh, with this, but you're doing fantastic. By the way, you're doing better Thank than 99.5% of the filmmakers I talk to. So you're doing extremely well, but I think you could even do, uh, you could take it to the next level, but I'm, I'm really, uh, uh you know, I'm, I'm really excited that you are a good example of what, how filmmakers can make money on Amazon during COVID. This is all happening. Mm -hmm. This is all happening to during COVID. Uh, and what are your plans now? Because, you know, you did this all TVOD, which is something that <clears throat> unless you know how to drive traffic, TVOD is a, a lost cause unless you can drive tra traffic and target an audience or have an audience to bring along with you. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to keep, uh, you know, sometimes the, the, the sales are down. Sometimes they go up. It, it's a little bit, you know, but I, I'll keep investing a little. I think I may expand now to Florida, try to expand to Orlando, Tampa, you know, Um but yeah, I'm going to keep in. I actually put, you know, I, I found the right spot. Now I have the movie for two ninety nine and fourteen ninety nine, um, because I feel there's a actually I feel that somehow I'm getting sales without marketing. Sometimes I think Amazon is promoting the movie itself because sure. you know, I brought money for them. So I guess the the algorithm or whatever. Um, but I, I would tell this also going back to the whole distributing and stuff like for me. I would never put my movie for free. That's just like so. You're you know, not gonna put it in an SVOD like Amazon Prime. And I see. I would. I would suggest to everyone. Put, I mean, put 99 cents. You know, like that's that's an okay price. If you have a movie that, unless, unless you really don't care about recouping your money because it was your own money or something, and you just want to get people to see your film. And in that case, I mean, you know, you can also put it on YouTube, right? If if that's your strategy, but if you really have to make money to pay investors to recoup some money, uh, forget about SVOD. Like you're not gonna make a lot of money uh, unless maybe you have it on, um, I don't know, Tubi or like AVOD at all the places. But just put it. A yeah, at AVOD, AVOD, AVOD at a certain point yeah. when your when your sales have gotten down to a point because like nobody really makes a whole lot of money on the SVOD Amazon platform mm -hmm. anymore. That's pretty much gone. Um, but AVOD. As we speak today, is a re I've seen the numbers. I mean, there's tens of thousands of dollars being made by certain films and certain genres. Mm -hmm. So there is potential there. But I absolutely milk this cow for as long as you can. Avod could wait. It could wait a year. It could wait two years before um, before you go to Avod. Actually, sorry, I forgot to mention that I actually I put the film also on Film Hub now. As SVOD, because uh, the rest of like other English speaking countries don't have TVOD. So I couldn't, the rabbit hole pictures, you know, I couldn't put it on the rest of like Latin America, let's say. Also, because I do have some Hispanic stars that are mm -hmm. well known in Latin America. So, and I have the movie subtitles. Oh, that was something that actually bothered me too from Amazon that they didn't <laughs> let me, they didn't let me put Spanish subtitles. They don't have that option, which I thought like you're missing out on like a yeah. huge. It's too, they can't deal with that kind of complexity 
from the masses. They can deal with that complexity from distributors who handle two, three, four hundred movies. And they yeah. allow that situation. It's a completely different business well, model. Well, no, like if you go and actually, no, no, like Amazon doesn't doesn't allow uh, Spanish subtitles on any film. It doesn't matter. Like, oh yeah, now they stopped it. Yeah, you're right. They did stop the subtitling. Now it has to be. Uh, I think it's. A, I don't know if it's a legal issue or what, but I told them like Netflix has been doing this for like years and you like if you really want to compete like you're missing on like you know <laughs> the whole like hispanic audience in the united states that would rather you know like my fa a lot of my family members you know they when i actually put the movie with subtitles because they understand english but you know you will miss a lot of little details not the same reading it in your first language you know so yeah that was one thing but through film hub that now i'm putting it on latin america but have, say, you, but have you had anything from them yet? Nothing come in yet? Uh, no, nothing. It's been recent. It's been recent. I haven't done any marketing also out there. So I'm just letting it to see, you know. See what happens. Organically yeah. to see what happens. Well, uh, yeah. well keep, us in, keep us updated on the Film Hub thing. I'm really curious to see. I haven't heard a lot of success stories from film hub meaning that filmmakers actually making a lot of money so i'm i'm curious to see uh in theory he sounds great and the, the and the and the the marketplace sounds great but i'm curious to see real hard numbers yeah. uh come in but man you're an inspiration brother um without question i'm gonna ask you a few questions ask all my guests uh mm -hmm. what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today um hmm. i would say uh, Focus on providing value to others, which is something that, you know, me as a director, when I started, I, <laughs> a lot of my friends now that work with me had a really hard time working with me because I was sort of a dictator. And uh, it was always like, you know, I would always think of my movie and this needs to be perfect because it's my film and my name is on it and I'm the director. And then, mm -hmm. um, that would just bring a lot of suffering, really, because I would be so frustrated and stuff. And when I kind of switched their mentality and started thinking about being, you know, a provider Service. of value Service, to yeah. others, to the crew, I want the, to really try to have everyone in the crew to reach their maximum potential in the cast. I want the actors to do the best performance that they can. I want the DP to have the best images. And I'm just the catalyst for these people to really push them hard so they can get there, you know? And also for the audience that's gonna watch my movie, it's not like watch my film, it's like, how can I really make your time worth that you can spend an hour and a half watching my movie and you're gonna have a lot of fun. So I just kind of like switching that mentality of, uh, you know, providing value to others. And, and it really, you can tell when you work with someone who's just there for a paycheck, you know? Yeah. And I don't I don't like working with those type of people. I feel I can see when there's someone there who obviously I want to pay everyone and I think everyone should get paid. But they're there because they care about their craft more than right. the paycheck, you know, so I would say that. Now, and what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Uh, on, on film or, uh, or in life? <laughs> I have. I would say, uh, don't take it personal. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Don't take, don't take film reviews personally. You don't know who that person is. If they Wonderful. like, if they like happy endings and you had a sad ending, of course they're gonna hate your movie. You know, uh, they had. Don't take personal the film rejection, uh, the film festival rejections. Maybe they didn't even watch your film. Maybe that person had a bad day. God knows, right? Don't take it personal. It's it doesn't it doesn't say anything about the quality of your craft and or of your film. So that's it, you know. And then, what are three of your favorite films of all time? Uh, <laughs> that's such a tough question for a filmmaker. There's three, three that come to your head right now. Well, uh, I mean, definitely The Lion King. You know, uh -huh. um, as a child and in Cuba, I would say. Uh, I think of films in like different stages of my life. So I would say definitely as a child, The Lion King and uh, The Gold Rush uh, from Chaplin. Yeah. The Gold Rush. Maybe. Yeah, it's, it's a fun movie. I, I always loved watching the movie. Now, as a grown up, I think, you know, I've seen brilliant films, uh, you know, 
a lot of brilliant films, but I feel that films that, let's say that I really saw and were like, really changed my perspective on what a movie could be. That I was like, I've never seen anything like this. Uh, I would say The Tree of Life from Terrence Malick mm-hmm. and uh, Sinek Duki, New York from Charlie Kaufman, mm-hmm. which is which is really funny because I see Kaufman, which I think, in it's my really, opinion, is, he's the most original writer and creator like in, in Hollywood when it comes to film. I think his stories are the most original. And... I see him struggling to make films, <laughs> to get financing, and I'm like, I mean, if Kaufman is like going through this, I'm okay, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's fine. Exactly. Now, where can people find you, uh, your movie, and your work? Well, the movie's on Amazon, you know, uh, on Amazon Video, and uh, they can find us on, you know, Rabbit Hole Pictures on Instagram, uh, rabbitholepictures.com. Uh, Rabbit Hole Pictures on Facebook, everywhere Rabbit Hole Pictures. <laughs> yeah. Ismael, thank you so much for being on the show, brother. You've, you're an inspiration. I'm glad to highlight a success story you know, on Amazon and today's world and TVOD and everything else. So thank you so much uh, for coming on and, and being so raw and honest with your, with your numbers and your experience, man. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Alex. I hope this really helps a lot of filmmakers out there and, uh, you know, keep hustling. You could hear at the end that we finished that interview with a thunderous applause by nature in the background. That lightning strike happened in those wonderful Miami thunderstorms that I remember oh so well. I want to thank Ismael for coming on the show and dropping those knowledge bombs on the tribe and inspiring filmmakers that you can make money on Amazon and you can make money on TVOD, but it takes work. And you really need to understand what you're doing. And Ismael is an amazing example of that. If you want to get links to anything we talked about in this episode, including watching his film, Death of a Fool, please head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 403. And thank you all for signing up for my new podcast, Inside the Screenwriter's Mind, a screenwriting archive of the best of the IFH Podcast Network. If you want to check it out and you have not signed up yet for it or subscribed for it yet, head over to screenwritersmind.com. Thank you again for listening, guys. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. Stay safe out there. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 